I see we're live here. And I just want to welcome everybody to the American Security Project event, Military Base Resiliency in Tampa Bay. We're going to wait about a minute or two here to go so uh, we can give a chance the, for Zoom to fulfill its function and get all our participants on board. Um, I would tell you personally, I'm more than delighted to host today's event. Uh, my one singular regret is that I'm not in Tampa, that um, for the last 10 years, I would say just about every, every year, the last 10 years, I've gone down to Tampa Bay to stay with friends and I have fished Tampa Bay extensively. And, uh, and I missed it this under COVID the last year and a half or so, but uh, we hope to get down there perhaps later this summer in the, or in the fall. So uh, it's a, such a wonderful area. And, and I got to tell you, it's fantastic fishing. So uh, like I said, I, I, re I regret I'm not there today. I see that uh, we are recording this event. It is on the record. Uh, what we will do on the end is we will consolidate it and put it up on our website tomorrow or the next day. So you don't necessarily have to take copious notes, uh, but there will be an exam later on. Um, hopefully you'll all pass. And I'm still wait another minute or so here. And I hope your weather down in Tampa is as nice as ours is up here today. In fact, we've got Florida weather. It's 85 at my house right now for the first time in a long time. Not sure we can attribute that to climate change, though. Okay. Uh, again, I'm Brigadier General Steve Cheney. Uh, I am the president of the American Security Project, former CEO. And welcome everyone to our event, Military Based Resiliency in Tampa Bay. Uh, let me talk for just a quick minute or two here about the American Security Project. We're a nonpartisan nonprofit research organization uh, focused on the long-term national security threats that face the United States. And our research examines topics like nuclear nonproliferation, counterterrorism, energy security, and today's topic, climate security, which intertwines with a number of those, particularly energy security. Uh, we have worked on the threat of climate change to our national security since our founding in 2006. And I think some of you might be familiar with some of our founding fathers. We had Senators Kerry, Hagel, Hart, and Rudman, two Republicans, two Democrats. And one of the thoughts at the time coming off the 2004 election was that Senator Kerry was not too pleased with the result but he was equally not pleased that when he talked about climate change as a threat to national security, um, he wasn't listened to and, and a lot of that was political. So the idea was to put together an organization initially that would have uh, eight flag officers, three and four star retired, uh, recently retired, uh, non-political, who would talk about the climate change, the national security impacts of climate change and use them as the spokespeople. Uh, to get the word out on how climate change is affecting our national security, and that has worked. And I know Admiral Gunn was pretty much on board since the get-go and has stayed with us ever since, and I'll introduce him in just a minute. Uh, one of the big aspects of ASP's climate security work is our National Climate Security Tour, which started in 2011. We've been to perhaps 20 plus cities uh, across the country to talk just this issue. Uh, and then in addition to that, we have an organization called the Consensus for American Security, uh, which is composed of a number of retired generals and admirals, ambassadors, SES types, senior executives, uh, well over 100 plus. You can go on our website and pull up the membership. But we use these folks as spokespeople, not just here in this country, but around the world as well. Uh, we work together to develop a consensus around the strategic national security issues that face the country. Um, such as nuclear weapons, energy and climate security, terrorism, American economic competitiveness, public diplomacy, and national security strategy. You can see we've got a broad base of topics here, uh, but climate change has been one of our founding planks ever since. Um, our members also host, host forums and other public events to educate decision makers about the dangers of failing to address today's threats, and we're going to talk about that spe specifically in a minute. Uh, I really want to thank our partner, the American Water Security Project. Uh, they were founded in 2018 and is led by a board and staff that has extensive experience in water policy, science, and advocacy. 
The American Water Security Project is a team of business leaders, scientists, engineers, policy experts, outdoor enthusiasts, conservation advocates, and thought leaders, that's a, that's a mouthful, uh, who are working to promote the urgent need for wastewater infrastructure upgrades to protect waters and water bodies around the country, certainly with Tampa Bay in mind today. The coalition educates on the negative effects of wastewater spills and dumps to residents, businesses, and tourism, as well as communicates the social and ecological values of proper wastewater treatment and advocates for remedies to correct the deficiency. So again, a shout out to the American Water Security Project for helping us put this together. As I mentioned uh, how we were formed in 2006, I was uh, on board really the next year uh, in 2007 uh, on the uh, board of the American Security Project. I was the CEO from 2011 to 2019 and I shifted over to being the president. Uh, you can catch my bio on the website. I am a Naval Academy graduate. I did 30 plus years as a Marine. Uh, my last posting was the commanding general at Paris Island, which has a very interesting climate story with hurricanes I can get into later. Uh, but the next to last job that I held was inspector general of the United States Marine Corps and also deputy inspector general for the Department of the Navy. And my boss at that time was the Inspector General for the Department of Navy. It's Vice Admiral Lee Gunn, who joins us today. Uh, Admiral Gunn had a very distinguished career in the Navy, 35 years plus prior to his retirement, and his last duty assignment was as Inspector General of the Department of the Navy, where with me as his deputy, he was responsible for the department's overall inspection program and its assessments of readiness, training, and quality of service. Well, let me get into today's topic here, and, I, and I'll talk for a little bit. Uh, as King Henry VIII told several of his wives, I won't keep you that long. Uh, but I want to talk about this specific topic. And, and we work for ASP because military-based resiliency in the face of climate change is crucial to American national security, both, both here and abroad. Uh, I'm not going to focus on the strategic implications all over, all over the world. Today, we're gonna to focus pretty much on Tampa Bay and Florida. You know, you know, Florida is home to over 20 military installations. And we wanted to come to Tampa Bay to talk about how important it is that the steps be taken to protect MacDill Air Force Base and talk a bit about how climate change is a threat multiplier outside of our borders as well. So let me start a little bit with the basics. Uh, the science of climate change is established and generally agreed upon. I am not here today to debate whether climate change is occurring. It is occurring. Uh, you can go on many, many websites and see it and see the results. The results are clear. We have seen a rapid and unprecedented warming in the Earth's climate system. 97% of climate scientists agree with these basic facts. And you don't have to take my word for it. You've seen it in Florida for the last decade plus. The 2020 hurricane season was the most active hurricane season on record, and 2021 is predicted to be, again, more active than usual. Uh, uh, the an average season has 12 named storms, six hurricanes, three major hurricanes, but last year you saw 30 named storms. Of these, 12 of the 30 made landfall, and six of them were major hurricanes. 2020 is now the season with the most storms on record, surpassing the 28 from 2005. Now, this might seem like uh, an anomaly, but there's evidence, clear evidence, that climate change could be weakening atmospheric currents that move these weather systems along. And that means that 150 mile an hour winds, storm surges, and storms stalling in place like hurricanes Harvey and Dorian are likely to become more frequent and Florida is gonna be a target. You know, we know that hurricanes are fueled by warm ocean water. We are seeing ocean temperatures rise uh, almost a degree per decade. Uh, as air temperatures also rise, the warmer air holds more moisture and it leads to more rain, more flooding and more damage. Uh, but one personal example is Camp Lejeune, uh, back with Hurricane Florence in 2018, by the time it got to Camp Lejeune, it was a category two going to category one, but the problem was it stalled there and dumped up to 20 inches of rain. Huge, tremendous flooding there. It caused three to $4 billion worth of damage 
uh, obviously none of it funded at the time. And they are still reeling from the impacts of, of, of a category one hurricane. So you can see the damage that it's caused. Climate change, rising seas, extreme storms, extreme heat, they all affect the day-to-day -day lives of Floridians and Florida businesses. But climate change also impacts military training and readiness in Florida. So we, we are here to talk about these impacts and, and they are significant, I will tell you. Um, they're they're not, to be, not to be written away. With that, uh, I am gonna turn it over to Admiral Gunn and let him talk for a second and perhaps about how it affects military installations, especially in, in Tampa. Admiral Gunn. Okay, Steve, it's great to be back. And the team has reassembled. The, uh, the Cheney gun team is uh, back, on, back on task. Um, in 2019, in the fall, the Union of Concerned Scientists published a list for general interest of the 18 US military installations on the US uh, uh, East Coast and Gulf Coast that are most um, threatened by the consequences of, sea of uh, climate change. That's sea level rise for some, it's droughts and, and inundation for others, but in some way or other, these 18 were all pretty vulnerable in the estimation of the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, eight bases in Florida have been ranked by DOD as among those uh, most threatened. And I don't have to go over that list with the audience here. You understand which ones those are. And at the very top of the list is McDill Air Force Base and its consequential uh, operations around the world in defense of America's national security. Um, rising seas are for Florida uh, in this area and in South Florida as well. And in the panhandle are a serious threat uh, that is going to have to be faced for a long time. The flooding of torrential rains of the kinds that Steve mentioned, but also uh, the king tides that are creeping higher every year or every decade uh, are causing uh, additional problems. Um, I was really interested to see the Tampa Bay Times uh, article a couple of days ago on the $215 million uh, invested in 2016 and following to deal with drainage and the cleaning of outfalls and, and the like. I think that all is ter terrifically commendable. So uh, that is evidence, I believe, of the kind of commitment that this area has and that the people in this area are willing to support to understand what the threat is and to deal with it. Um, by the way, it was great to see that Governor DeSantis signed the sea level research bill last week and uh, that the uh, University of South Florida will be the, uh, the flood research hub. I'd also like to mention um, someone named Hank Ovink. And no, I didn't mispronounce Hank's name. Hank is a Dutchman. He's from the Netherlands. He was the water minister uh, in the Netherlands. And um, for a period of several years, he was running the entire Dutch effort at keeping water out of where they didn't want it and getting water into where they do want it. And for the last 600 or so years, nobody in the world is better at that than the Dutch. Uh, Hank is now uh, consulting with the state of New York and with New York City on something called the uh, Manhattan U. And I mention that because it is in the United States, the primary example, I think, up to this point of what a seawall looks like and the ambitious intentions that uh, in this case are there to protect um, the financial district in Southern Manhattan from the ravages of gradual sea level rise. Um, in any case, worsening storms are something that we don't have to tell you about uh, here in a Florida audience. Um, and the general trend, of course, is, is the climate changes is that uh, wet areas will get wetter and dry areas are getting drier. It's uh, evidence no better anywhere than in the Southwest United States. In the last uh, couple of years, I visited Nevada a couple of times, Arizona, New Mexico, California, and Colorado. Um, and it is clear then at the beginning and now uh, as the drought has dragged on, 
what the terrible effects are of a prolonged great drought of the kind uh, will be that uh, are being experienced in the American Southwest. The, the consequences of sea level rise will come, I mean, I'm sorry, with, of climate change will come in a variety of forms. And for some, like much of Florida, is sea level rise and the violence of, of storms of the cyclone version. Um, but for many, it's drought and it's floods in the Midwest, the Northern Midwest in particular, floods have been an extraordinary problem lately. Algae blooms are in part a product of uh, hurricanes that have hit Florida. The management of seawater is something that is clearly front of mind for the people who are investing in the infrastructure in the Tampa Bay area. Um, seawater, potable water, stormwater, and wastewater all have to be dealt with. And as I said, that the evidence of action, activity, understanding of the problem here in Tampa Bay is clear when you look at the investment that has already been made and the investments that are planned. Heat stress, you know, um, Steve Cheney is a retired Marine and he insisted on running around in his career with a, a heavy backpack on and, and being out in the, the sunshine and, and uh, going long distances. These problems of heat stress that have to be carefully managed by the military are becoming more evident all the time. The number of heat stress cases that have resulted in hospitalization for mostly Marines and soldiers over the past several years has been increasing in spite of the efforts of the services uh, to prepare their troops uh, for the kinds of conditions they'll face. In Afghanistan and Iraq, regrettably, the troops on the ground have faced the kind of conditions we're going to see increasingly around the world as violence flares, as problems occur that the American people are gonna ask the US military to go and, and help alleviate. Um, we're going to continue to send troops into conditions that are hotter and hotter and we're going to have to consider more and more their safety as we do that. Um, back to Medill for a minute, of course, in addition to the sixth air refueling wing, uh, CENTCOM, the US uh, Central Command and the US Special Operations Command are headquartered there. Um, and their responsibilities uh, are not only regional in case of the Mideast for CENTCOM, but it's, they're also worldwide uh, in the case of SOCCOM. Abroad, where many of those uh, conditions that they have to deal with evidence themselves, um, the effects of climate change are adding to the difficulties that troops face when they go there, the causes that require them to come and the missions they have to perform once they're there. Uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief are becoming increasingly prominent missions for all of the five um, military services. Um, there, are there are tasks at home that are increasingly uh, falling to the military as well, not just the National Guard, but the active military in some cases as well, in helping the American people contend with the, the consequences of climate change. Risk management is something that the military has done forever. For all of my 35 years, I know for, for all of Steve's plus, three decade plus um, career, We've been managers of risk. And it's important that the American people understand that we are facing increasing risks in a variety of dimensions uh, as we continue to experience climate change. Um, I saw on the uh, McDill website, a, uh, a medallion uh, form there that had an Air Force uh, theme on it, it said, accelerate change or lose. Uh, that encapsulates, I think, very nicely what not only our military, but our civilian populace, our domestic economy, our diplomatic folks have to contend with in order to deal appropriately with what's, what we're seeing in climate change. And also to mobilize the forces necessary, not only to mitigate the effects of climate change, but to slow and eventually stop the, the changing of our climate. Um, in the military, particularly electric vehicles are 
uh, increasingly top of mind for planners. Um, there are enormous military fleets of non-tactical vehicles, all of which can be electrified relatively uh, simply and in the process, both run in parallel to what's happening in the civilian economy and also in some cases lead the way. Our economic competitiveness as the world transitions inevitably to a new and renewable forms of, of energy production, transmission and use. Um, America's leadership in that realm is a matter of economic competitiveness for us with the rest of the world. Um, there's a lot more we could talk about. Let me draw some quick conclusions. Um, we have to acknowledge the problem. The people in Northwest and, and Western Florida are clearly doing that. We have to get going. Uh, and the third point is the Tampa region is already going. And at the same time, we have to curb emissions too. So we have to manage our resources in a way that allows us to muster our defenses and we muster our offenses as well to deal with climate change. Um, a a three-star admiral I used to work for a long time ago named Paul Butcher had a sign on his desk. It said, lead, follow, or get the hell out of the way. And I think that's where we are, certainly in the American Security Project, when we look at America's opportunities and challenges in facing climate change. Admiral, Back to you, Steve. Those are great closing comments. And uh, if I could just add some personal observations from my experiences um, in the Marines in particular, but when I took over Paris Island, I was uh, a happy young Brigadier General and just totally excited about taking over that, that base because I would have a deep history with uh, Marine basic training. And when I rolled into the office to get turnover with my predecessor, he said, uh, you know, I'm thinking, what are the major problems going to be? What's the emphasis? I'm thinking it's got to be drill instructors or recruits or uh, all kinds of things. He goes, no, he says, your major problem is going to be hurricanes. They hadn't had a hurricane for 40 years. Um, and I, in a way, kind of thought he was joking, but they had a pretty good program just in case we were hit. Well, sure enough, three months later, uh, Hurricane Floyd took dead aim, category five, 170, 180 mile an hour winds, storm surge estimated to be 20 plus feet. Paris Island highest point was 13 feet above mean sea level. You do the math, we were all gonna go swimming. Uh, so we evacuated 8,000 recruits to the Marine Logistics Base in Albany, created one of the greatest traffic jams the Southeast has ever seen. Uh, fortunately for us, it, it paid us a glancing blow uh, did some damage, but uh, we were able to recover from it. But as an interesting sidelight, it went straight for North Carolina, cut Route 95 in half, shut 95 down for two weeks, went, and then it was a Category 2, um, huge flooding in North Carolina. Uh, but just to give you one personal experience, and since then, they have evacuated Paris Island twice. Fortunately, uh, they have avoided the dramatic impact of one of those hits. Uh, Florida hasn't been so lucky. Uh, when you look at Tyndall Air Force Base, uh, I think it was Hurricane Michael. I mean, it virtually wiped that base off the face of the earth. I mean, it was uh, devastation to the tune of billions of dollars. Uh, I mean, it would, and the F-22, it was a major F-22 base as you all in Florida are aware. Uh, those F-22s, they couldn't fly away. Almost all of them were, were damaged uh, in that particular hurricane. So uh, my point to this is, uh, we can't, it, time, now is not the time to be complacent. Climate change is just gonna make this worse. Uh, you really have to get going. And, and Admiral Gunn talked about uh, seawalls and the building of seawalls. You know, after Katrina in New Orleans, they brought in your Dutch uh, folks to come here and look at that and they built seawalls there. Uh, they did the same thing, by the way, in Manhattan after Superstorm Sandy, uh, whole lower Manhattan now has a pretty good sized seawall around it. Um, and I, I realize that's, that's adaptation, what we call adaptation, not mitigation. And to get onto the mitigation side of the house, mitigation is where you try to, try to stop what's causing climate change. And the bottom line is CO2 emissions into the air. And, and these are all tied together. The military is a big player in all this. There's been a big program within the Department of Defense called Net, uh, Net Zero. And that program is to get bases and stations to produce more uh, energy than they consume. Uh, and I'm proud to say Marines now have a base that is doing just that, Marine Corps Logistics Base in 
Barstow, California is, is now, uh, thanks to solar predominantly, uh, producing more power than it consumes and it's feeding back into the grid. And we're, the DO, whole DOD is aiming at doing this at all bases and stations across the country. So, I mean, that, that gives you an, a little bit of idea how the American Security Project is approaching uh, this particular problem. I add, might add to the audience, that there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question, please hit that. And, uh, and I'll, those questions will get forwarded to me. Um, Admiral, in all your travels, and I know you've done a lot over the last decade plus related to climate change, and you've enumerated some of the states, uh, how would you compare other states in, in comparison, for instance, to Florida in terms of impact of climate change, uh, particularly in relation to national security? That's a great question. Um, the, uh, the effects, as I mentioned, of our change of climate um, fall differently in different parts of the country. Um, and so I don't think there's a one size fits all, but in Florida, uh, I'm really impressed with what I see in the Tampa Bay region and in South Florida, where I've been a couple of times, where Miami, Miami Beach, uh, Miami Beach in particular is already experiencing some of the things that are bedeviling the folks here in Tampa. Uh, it is clear that people understand that there's a problem. In many places, uh, like South Florida, it's not just a problem of sea level rise, but it's a problem with the land as well. Mm -hmm. And in South Florida, of course, the land is porous. And you get days when, uh, even though you're able to fend off the direct rise of the sea, you get it bubbling up through the ground. Um, in any case, uh, the, the people in Florida, I think, are taking this seriously and are... Uh, perhaps going to lead the nation forward in understanding both the need to mitigate uh, and adapt uh, the, uh, to the effects of climate change. There are places that are where the warning flags are already way up. One of those is Hampton Roads, the Norfolk, Virginia area that you know very well, Steve. But that's the site of the world's largest naval base. It's also the site of Langley Air Force Base, which is the uh, Air Combat Command headquarters. And uh, the Marines and Army and Coast Guard all have substantial facilities there as well. And that land is subsiding at the same time the sea level is rising. And the problems that the military faces at the edge of the sea are really extreme particularly in cases where shipyards and piers are important to the operations and the maintenance of naval forces. And we are seeing that just here, not just here in the United States, but around the world. I mentioned in the West that uh, desertification and drought are the principal manifestations right now. Um, there is a Western States Compact that has been formed these things have been done largely without the um, involvement of the federal government. And the Western States Compact is dealing with water issues such as, for example, the snowpack in the Sierras and in the Rockies is much less than you would hope it would be at this time of year. And this is about the fifth consecutive year it's been like that. Therefore, the waters of the Colorado River which among other things, replenish Lake Mead, which supplies water for Southern Nevada, including Las Vegas, and also water for Southern California, including Los Angeles and San Diego. The, the uh, flow in the Colorado River is lower than you'd want it to be now and is forecast to be much lower during the summer. Also, the arid nature of the West the drying out that continues to take place and the heating of the air that makes it even more likely that that drying is going to occur is, is raising the prospect of forest fires. And the range fire forest fire problem is as big as it's ever been in the West. Four million acres of California burned last year in a fire season that lasted eight or nine months rather than what has historically been three or four. Um, so states are organizing, there's a Northeast compact of states informally organized to deal with transition in energy issues. 
uh, to, to uh, the hasten the transition to advanced forms of energy, renewables, means of storage, and the like. Um, there's an awful lot happening. I guess the bottom line, Steve, is that uh, it has been happening for the last five or more years, mostly at the local level, but there are great initiatives being undertaken. The renewable portfolio standards of, of states uh, are being raised pretty regularly around the country. And that's, uh, that's truly encouraging. So I think we're on the move in lots of areas. Yeah, I, to, to piggyback on your point about the, the fires in the West, I've, stay, I've been stationed many times at Camp Pendleton and fires at Camp Pendleton when during the dry season were nothing new. We had them back in the 70s and 80s. But what is new is the extent of them. And not only there, but of course, all of California and now you actually have battalions of Marines that are going to fight forest fires instead of doing their business, which is defense of our country. Uh, so and that's the, kind of, that, that's the kind of thing I was talking about. There are not only international global demands on US armed forces and humanitarian assistance and disaster response, but in the United States, it's not just the National Guard that is asked to do these kinds of things these days. And when the military can help, obviously we, we want to, but these, we not only lose days of training and opportunity to access training ranges, but we actually spend time and equipment and resources in doing things that we used to not have to do. Yeah, I mean, when Florence hit Camp Lejeune, uh, we had a battalion that was getting ready to deploy to Norway to relieve a battalion up there. They couldn't go because the weather was bad. And uh, of course, the flooding was extensive. So that particular battalion was delayed a couple of months while they stood there and helped with the uh, humanitarian effort there at, at Camp Lejeune. So another example of, again, climate change causing uh, deployment disruptions here uh, and the battalions that are supposed to be defending our country overseas instead of uh, doing, have to do humanitarian rescue efforts. Um, we're starting to get a number of questions here and, uh, and I, I've got one from Eugene Kelly and uh, it's, a, it's a little outside the continental United States and I could talk for about an hour on this particular question. <laughs> He said, are there any examples of the impacts from climate change serving as a catalyst for conflict and turmoil? And, uh, and I, I'll give a stab at this, Admiral, if you'd like, and, and maybe have you piggyback. Sure. The, uh, uh, oftentimes we say climate change is a threat multiplier. And I'm gonna give you two poignant examples. Uh, Syria had the worst drought in its history. 2011, 2007, 2011, I mean, it virtually destroyed all agriculture in, in the country. Consequence of that was obviously all farmers had to go somewhere where they could make a living or feed their families and they moved to cities. One predominant one being Aleppo. Some may be familiar with that particular city from the past, uh, but what happened there was a humanitarian disaster on, on two fronts. One, they had a great deal of difficulty trying to feed those people. And secondly, it contributed to the instability in the city itself. And, and that was twofold. Uh, one is Assad uh, started bombing the people that were there with barrel bombs. So it was a humanitarian disaster on that front. And the second was ISIS used it as a fertile uh, recruiting ground. Uh, and as everybody's familiar with what ISIS did from 2012 through 2017, uh, they were able to recruit all kinds of people because they were able to pay them and feed some of them. And they weren't necessarily uh, buying their line, but they needed to feed their family. So that's one case where climate change was a direct uh, impact on instability. And the other one I'll talk about for a bit is Lake Chad, a little bit controversial. But, you know, Chad's lost up to upwards of 70 to 80 percent of its water over the last 30 years. Uh, those people had to move, and they shifted around uh, Chad in particular, and they became a fertile grooming ground for Boko Haram. And Boko Haram recruited from them and it's created huge instability even so much today it is still added to the instability there. So those are, those are two rather prominent examples. Unless Admiral Gunn, you wanna piggyback on any of that? Uh, just a couple of, of quick ones. Um, there is an ongoing uh, contentious set of relationships in East Africa. Ethiopia is building an enormous dam on the Nile um, that is the water source for Sudan and Egypt. For the downstream nations, Sudan and Egypt, this is an existential matter. They're very concerned. 
with the fact that the agriculture in Egypt, um, for example, uh, its success for 5,000 or more years has deter been determined by the annual flooding of the Nile, and that may be interfered with. So that's a potential hotspot. Another one is the melting of the glaciers in the Tibetan Plateau. The Tibetan Plateau is, um, and those glaciers is the principal water source for the great Europe, uh, the great Asian rivers, uh, the um, Brahmaputra, the Yellow the Yangtze, the, the, uh, the Mekong, the Ganges. Uh, just a, a quick um, point on the Mekong. There are now 600 dams or more on the Mekong River. And there are six nations that depend on the water and the flow of the river and the headwaters are controlled by China. There is a Mekong River Compact, which originally was put together envisioning that China would join and China did not. So five of the nations, the ones that are most at, at mercy of the, uh, the Chinese decisions are trying to figure out how to make things go. The Chinese came in and created a new Six Nation um, Mekong Compact on their own terms. And so this illustrates that the downstream nations are going to have to dance the dance that the Chinese want. Uh, that's potentially a very serious long-term set of problems for a billion and a half or two billion people. Wow, wow. Well, I hope, I hope that, uh, Eugene, I hope that answers your, your question. I mean, it's, uh, um, there's turmoil all over the world and a lot of it is fueled by climate change and that's just going to get worse. And I'll, I'll, I'll give one last example and it's Bangladesh. Uh, one meter rise in sea level, is, you're going to have 20 to 30 million refugees. Uh, the, the sad part about this is that's going to happen. Uh, they know that sea level rise, that amount is going to happen because we haven't been able to stop CO2 despite the Paris Accords and all the agreements and stuff. Uh, uh, sea level rise is, is going to keep going until we really can get a bite of this and stop it. Uh, so the problem there is where are they going to move these 20 plus million folks? And, you know, they're not going to move them to India. That's a very strongly armed border. They're not going to move them to China. They're not going to move them to Myanmar. Uh, they have a problem and, and it's going to be just tremendous instability in Southeast Asia. Uh, as Admiral Locklear, the former Pacific Command commander said, uh, of all the strategic threats that he has to had to consider when he was there, like China or North Korea or many others, he considered climate change the worst, uh, which I think there's a pretty stark, and people asked him why, he says, because it can con contribute to instability throughout his entire area of operation. So uh, just, just but one, uh, one other example. Let me uh, move to another question. This one's from Arnaldo. How can local governments aid resiliency efforts of military bases across Florida especially in the Tampa Bay area? Are there previous examples of local governments around the country working with military installations in this capacity? Um, and I have a side note here that, uh, uh, that a bill was signed into legislation and in, uh, I think last week in Florida, SB 1954 and SB 2514 that will set aside hundreds of millions of state dollars for flooding infrastructure projects. Uh, it's a start, but there's still room for improvement. But Admiral, to get back to the original question, how can local governments aid resiliency efforts of military bases across Florida, especially Tampa Bay? Any thoughts on that one? I, you know, I ought to, ought to have done my, my homework on this, and I would know whether there was a, uh, an active effort between um, McDill and, and the local uh, officials, the city officials, and um, and the utilities. My guess is that there absolutely is. And I would invite any of the, the audience to weigh in and, and give us a note on, on how that works. But with the civic mindedness that I see evident throughout uh, the Tampa Bay area, my guess is that that is already there and it's already very active. I've seen it in operation elsewhere. Um, the, the people at Fallon uh, Naval Air Station in Northwestern Nevada and Reno work together all the time in trying to improve and mutually support each other. Um, the same thing happens with Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas in Southern Nevada. 
uh, in, in Arizona and New Mexico, there are similar um, cases of, of um, work going on between base commanders and their staffs and city officials. Um, you know, Fort Bliss and El Paso and the, and the city work very well together. And as a matter of fact, Fort Bliss was, last time I checked, one of the army posts that was moving most rapidly in the direction of not only preparing itself with a resilient electrical infrastructure, but also planning to support the vitals in the surrounding community in the event that the whole area lost electrical support. Because after all, as we've all seen in the military, uh, the bases don't work unless the locations around the bases work also. I mean, unless your soldier, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen can get to the base, um, then uh, the job doesn't get done. And so making sure with the city officials that the base they own is prepared for what's coming in terms of climate change is not only a civic matter, but it's also a military matter of necessity. Yeah, I know uh, when you, you mentioned Hampton Roads and uh, Naval Base Norfolk, that they have worked hand in glove with the local community. It's like that. It is, I mean, in depth for years. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a collaborative effort and a good one. Um, and and they're, they're, they're on top of this issue. Uh, similarly, uh, Paris Island in South Carolina, along with the air station in Beaufort, uh, have just received a grant from the federal government to, to discuss resilience and uh, impacts of climate change and flooding. Uh, so I think that there is funding available. You have to, you have to search around for it uh, to get it. But I, I think all the communities, as Admiral Gunn pointed out, uh, recognize that their livelihood in many cases is, is dependent uh, on these military bases. And you know, they, they want them to stay open and they want them to help them. And plus that their own community is threatened by climate change just as much. So. Uh, it's a hand in glove uh, operation. When we started our, our tour around the country on climate change back in 2011, uh, the first city I went to was Pittsburgh. You wouldn't think it would be affected much by climate change, but it's the confluence of three rivers. Uh, they have flooding problems. They recognize that. Uh, and in my view was almost every city I went to, the mayors uh, got it more than the federal government got it. I'll put it that way. Uh, outside the beltway, people were feeling the, where the rubber meets the road, people were feeling the impact and, and they want something to be done about it. And if, if the federal government weren't gonna help them, they're gonna do it on their own. But the federal government, of course, uh, certainly needs to help. Um, we have here a comment from Terry from the American Water Security Project. And, and I'll quote, he's worked on bills to increase funding for base resilience, which I just mentioned. Uh, are we allowed to say whether that funding is eligible for use in terms of managing or treating a basis stormwater or wastewater. Uh, as I mentioned, those pollution sources fuel harmful algae blooms that I would think would prevent training from taking place. Uh, no, fun, no fun running or swimming in a red tide. Terry, I, I, I feel your pain and I wouldn't be swimming in a red tide either. Uh, I'm not sure on the specifics or the legalities of having using resilience uh, funds to manage, treat, or basis stormwater or wastewater, but I would think it would be part of it, uh, Admiral? I would think so too. And everywhere I've gone, base commanders now think about their community responsibilities. That is, base commanders are thinking outside the fence line. And the people outside, as you mentioned earlier, General, um, are thinking about conditions on the base and how much the local populace benefits from having a robust presence there and a successful mission accomplishment for their base. So um, my hope is that the legislatures are becoming sufficiently aware of the importance of this symbiosis between bases and, and their surrounding communities that they would provide provisions in the legislation that would allow that to, to happen. It's, it's the case where the base needs to take care of its surrounding community, but also vice versa. You know, I would add that, again, from my experience at Paris Island, where uh, we had our own wastewater treatment plant. Uh, however, on rare occasion, it flooded. And you can imagine the disaster that that was. Uh, and then we would have to depend on the local sewage treatment to uh, solve our needs in that, in that regard. And I can tell you that was a huge problem in North Carolina uh, when Florence hit, because uh, the pig farmers, a lot of their sewage treatment plants flooded 
and polluted almost the entire farmland of uh, southern North Carolina. I mean, it was it was a it was a tragedy, a scope of which people a lot of people really don't recognize. Uh, and let, so let me flip a little bit here. And, and I had another question from Rich. Uh, what can military bases do to speed the adoption of solar energy and net metering in Florida? His quote was, the Sunshine State is woefully uh, behind in deploying solar panels. And, and I had mentioned earlier the net zero programs and uh, a number of bases and stations, Paris Island among them, have put up extensive solar panels. Uh, you go to Nellis Air Force Base, for instance, huge network of solar panels fueling the entire base. Fort Bliss is another one. Uh, I mean, I know they're uh, all over, especially in the Southwest, the, the solar energy side is just is gaining big, big time uh, on bases and stations. And, 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 it, and it's becoming more and more and more. I, when I was at Paris Island again, we were totally dependent. Well, I say totally. We were dependent on the local infrastructure for our, for our power. But on occasion, it would go down. Whenever it was a big thunderstorm, we had one causeway, one wire coming in. Uh, we could produce our own power from an oil-fired power plant that was built in World War II. Uh, it was horrible. Well, they've since decommissioned that and put in another backup plant, but they're, they're trying to go more and more on solar. So I know any base commander would want to have a renewable source of energy, one, because they, they can produce their own energy, and secondly, it's a money saver. Um, you know, they recognize that they don't have to pay the local community for, for that energy. And it, and it's, and it's a big deal. Admiral, do you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, the, um, public private, uh, partnerships are providing an increasing proportion every year of the military housing for all the services. Um, and to the degree that those partnerships specify net metering and then the use of renewables. Um, I think that we're making some progress. Now, um, one of the problems that the military has in dealing with the consequences of climate change um, is that the, the fixes the military wants to adopt, both for mitigation and for adaptation, uh, have to be seen by the Congress as suitable to support the mission. Um, it, I hope we're long past time when, when everyone believes in Congress that the military is only to kill people and break things. Um, uh, I know we're well beyond that in the minds of most of these people. And yet, occasionally, uh, in the recent past, the military has been criticized for adopting some things that are very forward thinking with regard to advanced energy and net metering and the like and been accused of squandering taxpayer dollars in ways that don't contribute to killing people and breaking things. Um, so uh, I think the sweet spots for these kinds of housing issues and base issues otherwise are the installation commands of the four services, uh, assistant commandant or the deputy commandant for, for installations, the the commander of the Naval Installations Command and their analogs in the Army and the Air Force, all of these, um, there are three stars that, who are leading all of these base organizations. And at those, those are the insertion points, I think, for the great ideas about electrification and net metering and efficiency, all of which are terribly important to the military in the future. Yeah, I'm gonna flip this particular point to uh, uh, the tactical side of the house. And I think it, it was General Mattis when he was the commanding general of the 1st Marine Division in Iraq. He said, well, I sure would like to get off this tether of fossil fuels. <laughs> and as many are familiar, we lost well over a thousand lives guarding fuel convoys to get fuel up to our um, vehicles and generators uh, throughout the AOR. And it still exists today. Uh, so the point being, if he had renewables, then you're not dependent on fossil fuels and you could use solar panels, for instance, to power your generators instead of using diesel fuel. Uh, the example I use there is the Lance Corporal who's lugging batteries and diesel fuel up to the top of a mountain to power up their, uh, all their radios and all their electronics gear. Instead of doing that, just pull up a solar array and, you, and no longer do you have to do that. So there's an immediate advantage to that side of the house. And, we're, and the military's getting there. I mean, they're using solar power 
tactically in a, in a number of ways. And of course, the Admiral mentioned electric vehicles. Uh, I just I see them coming with the advances we have in science on battery technology and storage. Uh, you're you're going to see that revolution uh, occur on tactical ve on vehicles uh, in the military. Maybe not necessarily the big ones, the tanks, for instance, but 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 you're going to see it. Biofuels is another one that we didn't cover. I mean, you may recall the Great Green Fleet under Secretary Mavis was he ran all the non-nuclear powered ships uh, ran on biofuels and aircraft and aircraft and aircraft. Yeah. Uh, Fred Smith, uh, CEO of FedEx, has run all his airplanes on biofuels at one time or another. So he's another one who runs a, an organization called Secure Americans Future Energy. Uh, here's Fred, FedEx, which has a huge fleet of airplanes, uh, all wanting to go to biofuels. So there, there are ways to get all to get alternative energy. So, just just to add a little bit more to it. Um, One more, Steve. On sure. uh, the uh, the Navy has now two large deck amphibious ships, LHAs, LHDs, that are hybrid drive. That is. They go fast when, when they, or when they need to go fast, they use their main propulsion engines. And when they need to linger, and they spend about 60%, maybe 70% of a deployment lingering and not going fast, they run their propulsion electrically. They do it off their generators. Now, at the moment, this hybrid system continues to use fossil fuels because the generators run on, on diesel but those generators can readily be replaced over the lifetime of the ships to sometime during the lifetime of the ships with fuel cells. And so they, the ships are already adaptable to some extent to the new world of energy generation and limiting emissions. Yeah, I mean, to piggyback on that comment, the, uh, I, I mentioned in passing that uh, the nuclear powered Navy, you know, doesn't need fossil fuels and doesn't burn it. And we at the American Security Project have, have long been proponents of nuclear power and nuclear energy and of course, nuclear propelled ships as well. Uh, and the, the example I use is the Navy's got, uh, I, I don't know the exact number, but I think submarine wise 60 plus at least uh, that are all nuclear and have been nuclear for 60, 70 years. Since 1953, the Navy has op operated more than 300. Effectively, they are small modular nuclear reactors in the most unforgiving operational environment on the planet without accident or incident. I mean, it's an amazing statistic. And when I, everybody's familiar with the drawbacks of nuclear power, we talked Three Mile Island, Fukushima, uh, Chernobyl, uh, three incidents over the last 60, 70 years, but the Navy hasn't had any. And, uh, and, and when you go back to other forms of power, i.e. coal, the coal industry's safety record is not exactly stellar. Um, and I, I know it, uh, it was President Trump that said the war on, on coal is over. And, uh, and he's right, but he, he was right for the wrong reason. It's over because uh, one, gas now is so plentiful, natural gas, that uh, many cities have dropped all their coal-fired power plants and gone to natural gas, and then renewables are killing them. Uh, so, I mean, I feel sorry for the coal miners in West Virginia, uh, but there are, are, are alternatives here, uh, and, and the coal industry is a, is a dying industry. And one more thing, <laughs> to piling on and taking your time here. Um, the, uh, the idea about the, the potential danger of operating nuclear power plants should be compared to the fact that around the world, every day, it's estimated that 19,000 people die from air pollution, God. largely attributable to the burning of fossil fuels. Yeah, I mean, I, I won't get into the Paris Accords and that whole business, we can talk, <laughs> we can talk about that later. Let me, I, I think we've got a couple of questions left here. Uh, this one's from John. What about the problem of saltwater incursion due to demand and extraction for support of a population base that demands too much water. Um, that, that's a, an interesting question. And, I, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll give you another personal anecdote about it. Uh, at Paris Island, we were redoing our golf course of all places. We had the money from MWR to do it, didn't cost the DOD a dime. 
and I was promised that we could drill a well and water the whole course with well water. Well, guess what? It was all saline. We, it didn't work. And we ended up paying a fair amount of money to the city to use water to water the golf course. Um, we were totally dependent at Parasana on the local water supply. Uh, and as far as I know, still are. Um, so, I mean, I don't know the, Admiral, I don't know the answer to that one. Well, in the, uh, the question is certainly relevant because in South Florida, the Miami, the South Florida Compact, the group of cities and counties that have organized in South Florida to deal with the consequences of climate change. As I recall, my last visit there, I was told that of the seven major aquifers that are dependent upon for drinking water in South Florida, five have been salinated in the last 20 years. Wow. And so seawater incursion is particularly a problem there. Um, eventually, one of the arguments that I see as selling us as a nation and as a consumer uh, economy on small modular nuclear reactors, generate electrical power, is that we need a lot of electrical power to make drinking water out of seawater. There's an awful lot of seawater, but it takes an enormous amount of power to make it into fresh water, but it's going to have to come there. Yeah, another anecdotal uh, piggyback on your comment, Admiral, is that ASP does a fair amount of work in the Middle East and there are countries like Qatar, for instance, uh, one that they're, they're converting to renewables with solar power immensely. And they're using that power to run their desalination plants. So, I mean, there's a, there is a hand in glove operation and several of the other UAE, several other countries are, are doing the exact same thing. So uh, we encourage that and it's part of our worldwide footprint. Um, I think I can take one more question. This one's from Anna Marie. How much leeway does the military have to accomplish resiliency goals, or are they dependent, totally dependent on congressional or high, higher level policy action? And I'll just repeat it. How much leeway does the military have to accomplish resiliency, resiliency goals? And that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, Admiral, do you want to take a stab or I can go at it? Let me, uh, let me take a stab at it. Um, the Congress is designed in the Constitution that the Congress will effectively control the purse springs. The, uh, the majority of the, the real work, the getting down to the bare, uh, down to the, the brass tacks and understanding the basics of the problems that any element of, of the nation faces is done in committees. And to the extent that the armed services committees of the House and the Senate um, our understanding of the contribution of resiliency measures to the accomplishment of the mission, then the services have, have a fair amount of latitude. But let me flip that over really quickly and say it's incumbent therefore on the services to make sure that what they want to do really does commission, contribute to mission accomplishment, really is done as effectively and efficiently as possible and that all of this is made transparent to the appropriate committees. The committees have been pretty unfailing in supporting legitimate ideas put forth in a reasonable way that uh, contributed to mission accomplishment, even if it, was, wasn't only, it, was, it wasn't only a direct connection. So I think there can be a lot of leeway and it's dependent on the leadership of both the committees and the military to make that happen. As the Admiral Will knows, the. Uh military goes through a budgeting process every year, which is absurd. And uh, the National Defense Authorization Act has to be renewed every year. Uh, so we at ASP keep an eagle eye on that act and what's embedded in it. And particularly in regards to climate change and resiliency and making sure that uh, our elected representatives understand the national security impacts of climate change and are writing that into their legislation and into the budget side of the house. And I mentioned net zero, net zero was a bipartisan uh, event. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't just invented by one party or another. It was, it was across DOD, it was both parties, Congress approved it, uh, the funding's been there. Uh, so it's those kinds of things that are, that are working, you know, not totally dependent on Congress, but comma, without the money, you're, you're in trouble. 
And unless you've got discretionary funds, of which there are some, uh, to use however you care to use them, uh, it, you certainly need a lot more than just discretionary money. Have I, have I answered that right, Admiral? I think, I think you've done absolute justice to that. I see we've reached the, uh, the witching hour here. I tell you, this has been a delightful event. Admiral Gunn, your, your uh, knowledge and professionalism is superb. I mean, you, you know this topic backwards and forwards, so I, I want to certainly thank you uh, for all your assistance and for your performance today. Uh, Thank you, right. Steve. This has been generally and your leadership in ASP. It's been indispensable and, uh, and it's great to be back on, the, on your team. You bet. And of course, I want to thank the American Water Security Project uh, for their assistance in, in what we did today. Again, we're, we've recorded it. You'll see it up on our website here in the next couple of days. So uh, go on our website, americansecurityproject.org. You can find all these subjects. You can find dozens of papers in this particular uh, uh, regard. You can follow us on Twitter. Uh, let me see. It's uh, twitter.com American Security Project. So uh, again, thank you very much. Admiral, thank you. And have a good day down in Florida. Thanks.